Hey everybody. It is 6.30, I'll call the meeting to order. Inclusion. The agenda additions and deletions, I'm informed that we have none this evening. The minutes for April 4, 22, kind of a motion the second to discuss. I'll make a motion. Second for discussion. Are there anything that appears to need to be changed? Any questions, uh, commentary? Mm -hmm. I, I didn't see anything. Look good to me. Yeah. Uh, make a motion to accept the minutes as is. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Pay orders for April 19th, 2022. Currently they're noted at 36, 481, 73 cents. Uh, there are no additions. Do I have a motion the second to go over the pay order? I'll make a motion to go over it. Second. Anything that uh, we see that's out of place needs to be changed? Hearing none, I'll move the question. All in favor of 36, 481 and 73 cents, say aye. 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 We do have a couple of honorable mentions tonight. Uh, it's noted that John McClellan had donated the uh, $1,000 select board stipend uh, to cover the cost of a, a sunflowered mural that's to be painted at the Alton Lake Concession Stand. Uh, Wallingford Thrift Stop donated uh, $300 to the monthly newsletter. That is the Wallingford Standard. Uh, Carol Tashi and Dennis do him uh, have repaired and painted uh, picnic tables over at Stone Meadow and I would also note that Rose and Jim Regula have put the uh, nets up down at the tennis courts for the oncoming season is Phil's not here do you want to wait on that or is he coming he's coming he's coming and we'll hold off on that then. We can um, do the Creek Road Bridge if you want. Just a letter of support. You have a uh, letter in here that's been composed uh, from Mr. Marcia. Uh, he's the Bureau Director of the Asset Management Bureau. Uh, those are the people that were looking, trying to get some money for the uh, Creek Road Bridge. Uh, we do have a letter. We were requested that uh, Rutland Regional Planning would like a letter of support. Uh, this is what's been brought up with. We just do need to uh, affirm that we will sign off on it. Yeah. By consensus, we'll accept it. In the additional paperwork that we've had left to us from Sandy's uh, as a result, we received this from the uh, ARPA committee. Uh, they explain here briefly that uh, they would like us to, uh, I guess it's actually make a motion to uh, take the ARPA funding and transfer it to the uh, town account. Uh, Basically, what they're doing is they're making uh, more available uh, through the standard allowance uh, that we can actually 
do some items that we would not be able to do if it was left in the current uh, funding process. It also reduces the reporting uh, segments that will have to be carried out as the funds are spent. Uh, what can we do, with Sandy? Just I think there's a couple of members from the ARPA committee here that we want to speak to it. Any, anything from the people with the ARPA committee? Sure, go ahead. Uh, my name is Bob Allen, and uh, I was one of the draft of the memo that you're currently reading. Under the ARPA rules that came out and were finalized at the beginning of the month, there is a provision in there that allows recipients of ARPA funds to transfer for lost revenue, and that's a term of art that's contained in the, in the regulation. And you can do that under a standard $10 million, or if the amount that you received is less, you can transfer that amount of money under this provision. Why do that? A couple of things. One, there's no question as to the amount that you transfer. It's presumed by the rule to be correct. As the chairman said, it permits much more flexibility in allowing the town to spend ARPA funds. Also, it, streams, it streamlines the reporting that the town is required to do with respect to the ARPA funds. So really, it's three wins. And you might ask the question, uh, why wouldn't you do this? And speaking with the right regional excuse me, Rutland Regional Planning Council, they could not come up with a reason why a town would not make this election and transfer these funds. Uh, so it's the ARPA committee's suggestion or recommendation that the town take advantage of this provision and elect to transfer the, as lost revenue the full amount of the grant that it has or will receive for the period here. Any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I would presume that uh, the funds that are going to be forwarded, I believe it's next year, they came to, they'll be included in this. Yes. Uh, That's why I said that would recommend that 100% of the grant be transferred pursuant to the lost revenue. And I'll add, I'm also on the ARPA committee. And uh, such a transfer would not preclude us coming before you with recommendations for how to uh, allocate that money once we've been through a process. So is this almost like a, a formal recognition that we're taking the money and we're putting it into the town? And then we'll be using it as, as we see fit? Okay. Is the fact that we have it entered into the minutes that we accept sufficient, or do we actually need to record it? I would do a motion for this. Okay. Is everybody pretty much in agreement that we'll uh, transfer it over and use it as lost revenue? Yeah. 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 By consensus, that we can do that. Very good. Thank you. Is anybody here just for the general public comments that uh, you don't really have any particular thing other than the fact you'd just like to throw something out there? The gentleman from Unicell is going to be calling in. Uh, obviously, they haven't done that yet. You want Steve to go ahead with world? Look, let's let him go ahead. We can get Bill later. Yeah. Steve. Yes, sir. Road Commissioner Report. You're, you're the guy tonight. The guy tonight? Yeah. Right. I assume he'll be along in a little while. Yeah, no problem. Well, we've just been uh, made, mainly uh, trying to get great, roads graded back up in the shape. They're still a little soft. I'm hitting the water pockets all over the place, but. We're running all over, all the gravel, great net worlds. All the equipment's running okay? Yep, everything's, 
Everyone's active. Yep. Yeah. Are we using the Ford in the hall or are we keeping that like this is a uh, backup truck? The little international? Yeah, the international. Yeah, that's that we're keeping that for just a little backup, yeah. Yeah. But so far everything's been good with uh, with the Kenworth since we got it back. Like I said, all we've been doing is grading roads and they've been hauling gravel. Trying to get things back into shape as best we can. Like I said, there's still a lot of water coming coming down the road. It's unbelievable how much water is in the ground. <laughs> you know, I look across to the pasture across my house there and it's wet. <laughs> <laughs> I think the old one we have to that I don't even want to go over here right here. In our packet, there's been a, I guess you'd say it's a letter or a notice of inclusion. Uh, I know this has been a topic with a number of towns in Wally or in the state. Uh, it's pretty short and straightforward. Uh, is there somebody here that I believe is going to present it? Well, I've been given it to read, so where would you like me to be so I can be best heard? Maybe here. Hi. Good evening. <laughs> so, that one works even better. Thanks. <laughs> then I'll give my phone back to this person. Or your phone back to her. <clears throat> and there's a few people here, right? So, some people came to hear this be read. I just wanted to share it with you. I know there was a process around this that I was only on the periphery of, other than agreeing to come and read it. So, I'm Wendy Savory resident of the town of Wallingford, and I'd like to read the statement that we're proposing be included. The town of Wallingford condemns racism, welcomes all persons, and wants everyone to feel safe and welcome in our community. As a town, we formally condemn discrimination in all its forms against people in any marginalized community and commit to fair and equal treatment of everyone. We will strive to ensure all our actions, policies, and operating procedures reflect this commitment. The town of Wallingford is and will continue to be a place where individuals can live and express their opinions freely. I'll leave the rest with you. I would ask the audience and the board, actually, does anybody wish to have a comment or? I think it's pretty all-encompassing. Other DEI statements, um, diversity, inclusion, inclusion, or sorry, uh, I can't remember where the E is, but some recognize uh, the fact that we live on taken uh, Native American land. I don't know if we need to do that in ours, but that's something just to think about. Um, but I think it seems, I, I'm ready to sign it myself. Any comments from anybody out there in the public? Yes, ma'am. Ann Awa Memorial Drive. I was not part of the group putting this together, but I really appreciate the initiative and the thought that they put into bringing this before you. I think having such a statement on record, it's just a, a, a statement of value and it's very important for our community. 
afternoon too. I'd just like to add. So my name is Alicia Pinsonell. I live on Elm Street. Um, and I was one of the five local people um, who have started to spread this initiative around Vermont. And obviously wanted to bring it to my home. Um, beyond the fact that a declaration of inclusion is just the right thing to do to let everybody know that they're welcome here. There's also a lot of economic benefits to um, approving a declaration. You know, it signifies that you're a welcoming community for everybody, which means more people buying homes here, which means more tax dollars to fund projects and roads and all of those things. So beyond um, being the right thing to do, there's also an economic component that I just want everybody to think about. I do know that other towns, I specifically I know Clarendon had an article as it was printed in the paper that their board wished to take a little time to discuss it. Um, I would ask the board member, do you prefer to take care of this tonight or would you care to, uh, myself personally sitting here, I have no problem signing off on it tonight. Uh, however, there may be others that wish to consider or talk with other persons. What, what's your pleasure? I don't have any problem signing this tonight. No? Neither do I. I couldn't right hear you. I'm fine with signing this tonight. Sign it tonight. Carolyn? I'm fine with signing it. Same. Yeah. I'm totally willing to sign it when we do it. We'll sign your inclusion at the end of the meeting. Thank well, we you. thank you very much for stopping in and your opinions. Thank you. Long for day update. Um, the reason not to, uh, we're yeah. a little ahead, but, but uh, Phil's here now. Phil, Phil Baker's here now, if we want to go back. Oh, okay. To the hype over here. <laughs> <laughs> Steve gave us a brief update that basically everything's running good. Yep. What would you like to add to the mix? Uh, nothing. I don't know what, if you talked about any of this school project or not. Yeah. If not, great. I'm good. I haven't, haven't got anything else. As far as I know, Steve went over the rest of it. Do we want to jump into the wastewater stuff? Uh, we have a couple of things in the paperwork. One is the... Uh, pamphlet on the isol on the isolator and stuff. Um, the sign off that Nancy has sent us is due back on the twenty sixth. I personally would like the other fellow members of the board here to have a chance to look this over and perhaps even talk with Phil. Uh, my thought is I think if we actually have a, a uh, meeting later in the week, perhaps during the daytime that we can get in here and discuss this a little bit more after you've had time to read the last of the emails and the isolator manual or it descriptive here. Uh, there are a couple of requests and uh, there are a couple of emails from Mill River Union yeah. that uh, they would like to address before it's signed off. Uh, is it agreeable with everybody that we meet later in the week, maybe one, two o'clock in the afternoon on one of the days? I'm okay. yeah. Yeah. That works okay for me. I don't know, Carolyn. I, uh, did, I probably will still be at work. I have one day off this week, but I plan to be out of town. Okay. I don't um, get out till 4.30, so. Maybe Sandy can work on what day works out. She'll let us all know what the, okay. what the timing is on that. I could also possibly meet um, virtually. Anything else besides that, Phil? No, I, I'm good. I, I was just going to refer basically to what Steve has told me this morning when I talked to him. Good enough. Everything else, all I had. We didn't have anything on the update. Quarter financials. Uh, so I gave you, uh, I'm reporting for the third quarter, so we should be at 75%. Uh, 
ordinance fines, I want to let you know we just got a payment of 2200 so that brings us up to 80%. I think we'll hit our budget. Uh, transfer station fees are up over uh, $8,000 for this quarter, so we're already at 141%, and that's because of the increase in the uh, costs. Um, interest on past due taxes is already close to 20000 and we budgeted thirteen. And then the three, the summer wreck, the Elfin Lake uh, gate and concession, we did not budget anything, so what we brought in is a plus. And under expenses, <coughs> uh, the assessor contract, he's only at 54%. We'll, we'll see, uh, he'll uh, start working more hours with the, uh, now that the grant list is closed with grievances. Road crew salaries and overtime is over budget because of the increase in salaries, so we can offset that with the carryover from last year of 27,000. Um, and then one other uh, highlight is transfer station operating expenses is only at 60,000 or 57%, so we're under for some reason there. And as you know, the special officers, that, that's going to be under budget because you cut your, your hours back. And under capital, those uh, three funds, I'll fund those at the, in June. And today was tax day. And uh, the amount that's going delinquent is almost 125000 and that is up around 7500 from last year. Do you have any questions? Any questions? Are everybody good? We reduced the total spec for the transfer station. We set up facilities to pull up twice a week. Okay. Compactor fit more in so they only prove you know, so once a week, so health savings <laughs> there. And I talked to Art today, and he's, he thinks once a week is fine. It's working so well, so some expense saved there. We're all good. More than for less. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> These couple walkers or hikers over to uh, Stone Meadow this week sent us an email that uh, apparently the bud jumps that we covered over over there uh, have been opened up again. The, the trees that were covering them up have been taken away. Uh, and basically, the Conservation Committee. Um, is kind of in a quandary of what we can do to eliminate that. Uh, the gentleman from VLCT who was over there uh, doing some of their trail inspection indicated those jumps actually are uh, considered a hazard and a real potential uh, for injuries in a lawsuit to come out of them. Uh, Bill, I'm not sure what we can do. I know. Charlie looked over there real quick, and he doesn't believe that we can get up in there with our excavator or anything we have. Do you have any suggestions? I had considered if we can get them jumps out of there, maybe placing some stones like we did down at the uh, Meadow Street ball field in their place there, if we can get them into that place. and block it off so it would be totally unappetizing for their future attempts at putting those jumps back in. Any ideas? Well, this is supposed to be at 7.50, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm glad I came early. Um, we, we were, a week, uh, last Monday, we were, the whole Conservation Commission walked the trails, the, most of the main trails, <clears throat> to see like, what needed work for runoff or widening or routes to be a tripping hazard. You know, he was giving us really good ideas on, on what we could be doing 
a lot of it which we could do ourselves too. And and the very last thing, this these jumps were built unbeknownst to anyone. Five it's been five years now, so this has been going on a long time, and we thought the issue was done. So the very last place where we walked, we walked up the book path and up to where the jumps are, and lo and behold, <laughs> we had put like logs around the edge so that the new multi-trail wouldn't, you know, you couldn't go over the jumps. And then the people from GE who had volunteered all their time, they had covered them all up with all kinds of deadfall. And well, they were all uncovered. And not only that, new holes had been dug to make the jumps even bigger. So the trail expert who was, um, he has a, a trail business in Castleton and his name was Drew. He looked at the jumps. He said, they are not going to be easy. I said, should we get our shovels out? He said, they're, they're, it's not going to be that easy. But the ones that they are again going across the rim trail, which is where people walk their dogs, read the stories along the way, and they're crossing the pass and they're bigger. And he said these were obviously amateurs because these bigger jumps across going down, they had cut off saplings to hold them for support. And he said, my God, if somebody fell, they would get impaled on these things. I mean, it's just, he's, and then on the second one, there's a big like hole in the ground that they had obviously dug up. Again, like worse hazard. He said, these things are. So I went and made, I, I went and saw Sandy, and I made all these really bright colored sides. Like these bikes are not allowed, and these jumps are dangerous. So far, I don't think the signs have been ripped down, but I think it's just a matter of time. We have no idea who's doing it. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. and, and if you can't get in with equipment, all you have to do is do something that they can't remove things easily and in 10 minutes start biking again. <laughs> is, it, is it worth it to try to, I know, I know we don't know who is doing this, but is it worth it to try to put out a call saying, you know, if you are doing this, can you come and help us maintain the Outer Limits Trail to make something more? Because it seems like they're, the it seems like it's, it's pers persistent in terms of the, they want to have these jumps there. But if we're going to continually in, put more and more investment into destroying these jumps when they get made, wouldn't it be better to try to change that, that feeling around so that maybe it's a positive interaction where they actually help somebody like they, we get GA to come back in again and then help again well it was such a liability issue when the man from Vermont city of leaks and towns or whatever that's called I wasn't there but Karen McLeod was there I mean he nearly got hit by a bicycle when he was visiting the site but no but, but like said insur it was for insurance liability and we and so the the outer limits trail which has a totally different access on Walden Lane which is hard to get to because you can't really get into it from Walden Lane because there's stone. I remember what, when it came out, it was there's a big log right in front. And Morgan's got, that's Morgan, right? Can I, yes. can I interject an opinion? Yes. Um, so I spend a lot of time out there in the Outer Limits area. Um, and uh, recently I've noticed the drama. Um, in my opinion, we need to remove what's there and re-address the trail itself. And I'm very willing to take that on as a project for the summer. Um, I'm just hoping that I can get some assistance with that. I'm sorry, I just rode my bike over here and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> um, it is super dangerous what is yeah. out there. It's also an infrastructure that was put in with a lot of time and effort. And I think by asking people to go somewhere else, it's like asking folks to only use rollerblades on the um, scope skateboard park. So if we move what's there and spend a little time on some of the trail that exists that needs a lot of help, 
I was out on it this morning and I went over the handlebars because I hit a root that was buried under some loam and um, I think we can fix it by just creating a little signage and uh, making other parts more desirable. Right. And then the idea of if we can, I'm just thinking of it more of an, uh, an education thing, because obviously the punishment, the obviously the signs that say you can only ride on the main trail, they aren't being effective. So if we can find some way of reaching out, even if we can't find those pe those people that are doing it, maybe we find somebody else who's willing and wants that, like to be able to make a, something that's a little bit more inviting. And I and I think you have to realize that we are not the recreation committee. We are. No, the, I'm not. I'm not no, no, I know, but we are the conservation committee. And one of the goals I was the very, one of the very first people on it in 2003. I guess we started is that it was, it's for conservation, and if there is to be any recreational use, it is to minimally disturb the landscape, to not, you know, bother the wildlife or the flora and fauna. And so the way it's been all these years and these little walking trails really has minimally no, disturbed. for sure, but, but I think there's a way to still make bike paths like that. You look at Pine Hill Park, Pine Hill mm -hmm. Park is still a very vibrant, in terms of ecological space, yes. but it yeah. also has trails. Right, but I do. don't think we, and that's, that's a topic that will be coming up at the Wallingford Conservation Commission, because is that really something we want to do to that park? Well, I'm, not saying, um, I'm not saying turn the, entire, the whole what? entire park into something like Pine Hill Park, but I think Right. There, there's definitely a need for it if people are going and actually doing this on their own and risking their selves to, to I think it's a very tiny minority because I, the trails that we put in last year we asked like why are there no bike why is dangerous. why is no one using it because you can't get to it yeah. you can't get to it without having to pick your bike up and going well, we were over told it was way. boring it just needs no it's Not it's that <clears throat> they need a little bit of attention by somebody who knows what they're doing. And like I just said, I would love to take that on and get groups of volunteers to help me out. I think that it's a really great resource for local teens who don't have parents who can drive them mm -hmm. to Pine Hill Park. And they also don't have the bikes that it takes to be at Pine Hill Park right. because they can't afford them. So if we can have a really great alternative to that that they can get to from town i think it'll be really good to get some kids off screens and i'm not saying to to do it where you would completely disregard the idea that conservation is incredibly important to that space because like when i was growing up i used to go to a place called t-town lake preservation which is was a completely like this huge huge or a park basically that was maintained by volunteers and it was one of my fundamental like growing up parts but i also know that this is a increasing segment in terms of interest and if we can keep kids and we can keep other people coming into town for something like this it doesn't have to be an intense park because we don't have that many people like rutland does no. but just to make it so that it is more enticing then we don't so that they stay away from the main trails right. if they're, that's the idea if they're done properly and safe it'll it'll invite the people to go to the proper to the trails more designated there has to be able to make a compromise between we'll say the copper the conservation and the rec committees oh. because that area and I, you'll find that it's more than just teenagers and children many adults want to do that too and that keeps them in our town to do the activities and not going out of town once again let's try to keep people here to do things so they and maybe other people to come there has to be a way to compromise. I mean, that was back, they were all designed back how many years ago? Our society has changed, our culture has changed here in town. We should address to see what changes need to be made and find, make safe trails. And Morgan, this is, this, Morgan knows this stuff. This is what she does. And e even if we don't mimic Pine Hill, they have a lot of resources that we could, like Shelly Lutz and stuff, that can help design things to make it safe, but still, Right, well, it's, it's a big area. issue if we should even be attempting to do that in that small area. No, and, I, and, and I'm not trying to... to, to it's, not a, it's not a high hill park. No, no and I'm not trying to discredit the idea that these are dangerous, and I, I don't want dangerous things to be on our thing, but we also, I think, 
if there are people that are willing to take the time to do this on a public piece of land, then we need to redirect that energy to something that will be safe and will be used. So they can channel their energy to help build it properly. Not to do it for five years on those, those jumps. But it's not working. If that's not working... We could come back to the problem of the jumps. It, it would be my suggestion that we hire Phil to go up there with his mini excavator. Yes. And just dig the... Dig, the, dig them out and flatten them out. If you look at those jumps, you can see somebody originally dug a hole and then just piled up a lot of dirt to make a couple right. of jumps there. I think Phil could probably, if he looked, he could get in there with his mini excavator, take the jumps right out, fill the area back level again. Right. I just think that if we just do that and we don't address the idea that somebody is wanting to make these jumps over and over and over again, that we're going to be paying Phil well, as much as Phil might like the money on it. Like, we're going to be paying him more and over. Well, my over. other suggestion would be that maybe, I mean, the bike trail comes up off the road, basically from the south, and curves up around, and it kind of comes close by the rim trail. Maybe yeah. we put in a split rail fence that physically separated mm -hmm. the walking trail from the bike trail. Yeah. Yeah. Because we put logs in, but they just rolled them away. Yeah, but the idea of a fence away. is good. Yeah, and you, Half there's... of the jumps are on the other side of Rim Trail. There's one here, there's one here, Rim Trail's in the middle. Right, so getting, getting rid of the jumps first, but then trying to make sure that somebody who does want those jumps, they, there might be an outlet for them coming down the pike versus them saying, oh, these people destroyed the jumps that I worked on for hours upon hours. I'm going to make them again as some kind of rebellion. And move them because if they jump off the first one, which is on the right-hand side, and there's somebody coming they don't notice, they're, they're going right. to hit them. Right. If we could just remove, like you were saying, the jumps that are in that area and have a load of uh, gravel dumped over on the, um, the road that takes you out to the camp, over near that side of the park, we can't do that. It's a, it's a, it's the project, it's the boys, boys camp. Boys but so it's how it's how not far, the townland. How we, far can we dump? Can we use that road to dump a load next to the trail? That's we tried to get the jumps down there. Number one, the kids said no, this is an awful place. Well, and kids are going to say no because they're lazy. The fathers said, oh, it's dangerous. The and parents said that. A nature corridor, so we okay. can't build it there. Okay. And a in the process road. of talking about that road, because I wanted to have an entrance down there, yeah. the end, they said no. We figured out, oh, we could stay on Waldo Lane and come in Waldo Lane, but then nobody was interested in wanting to do it at that school. Well, I know for a fact that I, with a truckload of gravel, that I can make that section over by the Critter Camp, that section of the Outer Limits Trail, I know that I can make that the most desirable spot for mountain bikes with maybe two weekends worth of work. Will you take a walk with us and show us? Absolutely. Yeah, we, I'm, out there, I'm out there two or three times a week. Because we, we walk there and we are really, really close to the boundary where we're not supposed to Okay. Be. So, so we, I mean, <laughs> Because we were trying to move it to make the trails better. Even if we put a load of gravel, like, up on our side, closer to those trails, we just need to be able to wheel wheelbarrow back and forth. Have you walked through that lower area down there? I've walked every trail in okay, so much. But you're much more confident in getting a truck up there than I would be. Well, <laughs> I think with the, if we destroy what the dirt, what is creating those jumps, if we destroy oh, that, that can be used. Yeah, then we yeah. can reuse some of that and maybe get more somehow out that way. Yeah. Did Debbie right. say that there were branches sticking up where they had cut them off and if they fell on them, they would be injured? Yeah, that's a horribly dangerous spot. Yeah. From a mountain biker perspective, I would not even go on that. Uh, the kids are using them because it's like the feature that they can get to easily. Mm -hmm. If there's a cooler feature somewhere else out on that trail, they're going to go to that. I'd like to help. Yeah. Call, call Debbie. Okay. 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 So I guess the big thing on our end is 
making sure that we can get the jumps destroyed. If we can figure out some plan for that. that that's what I think we'll want to do, is just take them right out of there. Yeah. Can you take a look at it, Phil? I'm going to go over with somebody that can show me, because I've never been there. Don't know Tell me when it. you want to go, and I'll meet you there. But be more happy to donate my time with the machine and go over there and get rid of them to make it safe. Yeah. <laughs> so we can do that. Okay, cool. Um, some evening is the only time really is good for me. Evening or weekends. I think I this one's good for me, too. I'll give you my phone number. Yeah. Yeah. Call me. And I, th I think this is a perfect opportunity for the yeah. conservation committee and the, the recreation committee to try to come together yeah. and come up with a plan that's going to work going forward for both both commissions. Yes, definitely. So Phil, you and Carol are going to get together? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And probably Debbie. Sure. Yeah. I can be there too if you want. Yeah. Whenever it works. The more people yeah. that know what they're doing, the better. I wanted to put this in somebody's hand for the recreation committee. Um, so for application. Okay, I think we leave it like that for now. And hopefully next meeting is, I believe, the fourth. Maybe we can hear how it came out then. And it doesn't keep getting rebuilt. <laughs> it's like a never-ending story. You know, so five we have to, years. We have to Just... break the cycle and then take <laughs> yes. another route for them. You guys always Sooner. This is yeah, 7.55. <laughs> we cruised through a couple things. But <laughs> you cruised. Thank you. Nelson Tift. Hello? Yes, it's uh, Nelson Tift. I'm with the board. Yes. Can you hear us, Joe? Hello? Joe, can you hear us? Mm -hmm. No, that's me. It's not, I, it's, yes. Can you hear us, Joe? This is a uh, walling for select board. Volumes up, yeah, because we can hear him fine. It's more about that week. Hello. That's all. Good. Real weird. Are you there? No, he's, he's not there. Uh, she hung up on him, so I'm going to try to call him on the handheld. Well, here, try calling, try calling my phone. It's got to be on his end, Sandy. It's got to be. Sit down. 
just we just can't do it till the next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jeff. Can you hear me? Okay. I have you on. I have you on speakerphone, so um, you have to use my cell phone. So your the select board's here if you want to give us a brief presentation. access 
to the facility as they would under the existing lease. All we simply do is provide a lump sum and or scheduled payment for the right to collect the, the loot from the lease for a given length of time. Uh, what that does for you, it allows a stable, budgetable income stream for the next 10 plus years, or depending on the length of term we, we talk about. If the lease goes away during the term of our purchase of that lease, we absorb the financial hip, the financial impact of that loss, not you guys. If the carrier decides to leave or any additional calls from either Black Dot or MD7, certainly we've dealt with them over the years. We would essentially handle all those um, calls for you. There is no, there's not a lot of downside risk from your part taking the transaction. We take in excess of the lease terms. And if you have, in this case, the lease started in 2017, the rent commenced in 2018, it runs for 15 years from 2018, so 2033. We would buy in excess of the time left on the lease. And if in this case, AT&T, if they were still um, a viable wireless opportunity going forward, we would re-up the lease with them. Uh, if they leave in the meantime, they leave in the meantime. The other benefit for municipalities or anybody really is if there's additional space in the leased premise to add a second carrier. And I walked through this with Sandy uh, briefly we would try to add a second carrier and any new additional revenue we were able to bring on by adding an additional carrier to the facility, we would split with the town equally, half going to the town, half going to Unison. Um, that new revenue stream that we create, you have the ability to either keep as a regular monthly income or you could call me up and we would be happy to provide a proposal for that new stream of income should you want to sell that also. Uh, one of the questions Sandy had asked was regarding, uh, have we done this before? And yes, I've done this over the years, hundreds upon hundreds of times. Um, with regards to municipalities, yes, I've done it with municipalities. With regards to, have we done it in the state of Vermont? Um, I'm gonna go back and pull up some of the stats. We've done, I think it was 39 transactions since April of last year through April of this year within, within the state of Vermont. And we had a breakdown of what they were from with regard to types of entities. And I'm just gonna try to find the um, exact breakdown. We had done one with a church, a nonprofit. We had done 15 with individual property owners, one with a large corporation, uh, 13 with small businesses, two with tower companies, and seven with unknown entities, which could have been trusts or trustees or estates. Uh, any questions to this point? What's the bottom line? Are what you going to offer comparable to what we're getting from AT&T right now? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? It was, it was very hard to hear you. What is your bottom line? Is the money offered is comparable? Yep. So essentially, the based on what we had indicated, what we looked at, and, and Sandy, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, please. The current rent you're getting is fifteen hundred and eighty-nine dollars and ninety-two cents per month, and that's set to go up in July of this year by by mm -hmm. my calculations by three percent, which would put you to. Um,
which is the number I would probably use because we wouldn't close. We'd probably close sometime if you want to do it yesterday. We wouldn't close before that time anyway. You'd be in the 300 and give or take $330,000, $335,000 range. I haven't actually come up with an exact figure because I was expecting to uh, just kind of walk you through the basics tonight. But you'd be in that 300, 330. A 330 to 340, $330,000 to $340,000 range. That can be paid out over a lump sum period if you chose to take it extended. We basically do one closing, so we'd close even if you wanted a scheduled payment. We would close, let's say, for argument's sake, you know, June 15th. June 15th, we'd close on the transaction. We essentially escrow the, the funds for you, and the funds that we escrow. We don't keep the money or the, the, the upside of that money. I mean, if we put it in a, an account that generates 5% return compounded for the length of time we hold the proceeds for you. So in essence, even though it's 300 and say $30,000, we'll use just for argument's sake, up front. Um, if it was paid out over a schedule of nine years, so 10 payments over nine years, that same 330,000 would pay off four, just over $400,000 over the nine years. So you'd be getting essentially a $40,000 payment or more than double what you're currently getting a year for the next nine years. It's 10 payments because the first payment would be at close and then the next payment will be with at 12 month, the 12 month mark, which means you'd actually get 10 payments in 108 months. And one of the other, I guess, points I'd like to make is the, how we pay the money out, how we pay the proceeds out is entirely up to you. And I say that because we've had, we've had municipalities who have wanted to see a portion up front and then a schedule, you know, one payment every five years. We've done it where we've done small payments up front and a balloon payment in 10 years. You really can schedule the proceeds based on your needs. So as not to having, not to have, I don't think Sandy had mentioned this goes into a kind of a repair fund. Is that correct? It's a maintenance repair fund for the town? It's a building fund. So, you know, if you don't have needs now and you, your building fund is generating either, you know, a very low interest rate or one that's certainly below the 5% that we provide, you could keep it with us and we could pay it out as a schedule. What, what we can't do though is if you, once you come up with the schedule, whatever that schedule is, once we lock that in, we have a hard time adjusting at that point. So you'd, you'd receive a promissory note based on the schedule you provide us that you wanted to see it but we couldn't accelerate that. Um, or if we did, it would have to be recalculated based on the length of time left. So it would be less than originally quoted if you came to me and say year three and said you want it all at that point in time. How long has your company been in business? 21 years now. I started doing this for a company called Wireless Capital and started the asset class back in 2000. Um, and I ran, the, I ran New England for Wireless Capital. I left them, I came to Unison. I left Unison, I went back to Wireless Capital. I left, Wireless Capital sold their last portfolio and got out of the business and I came back after a small break, came back to Unison. So I've been doing this essentially on and off for about 17 and a half years. We've added in that time period uh, four and a half million dollars of new <coughs> revenue stream to the leases we've purchased. You know, we've split with the landlord, so that's been you know just over two million dollars worth of new revenue streams that we've added to the sites that we've purchased. Uh, we buy these because for us, our business model is such that we're making money betting that these hang around. And when we bet wrong, like as an example, the industry last spring, T-Mobile bought Sprint. And any place where there was a T-Mobile and Sprint site or lease on the same either rooftop or tower, one of the two got canceled. So we lost, lost over 400 leases between last spring 
and now, just due to the decommissioning of the sprint sites. They're going to do another round coming up shortly for all of the sprint sites that are not on the same roof and are not on the same tower, but cover the same geographic space. So if they have overlapping coverage, they're going to start decommissioning those sites. So it's, these leases are terminable. You have 30-day termination language in yours. I read it, we read it again today. Um, you've been approached, I believe, a second time, according to what I, the conversation we had with Sandy by MD7, looking for a rent reduction. And they don't just ask you for a rent reduction. They, they make it appear as though it's a rent reduction or else they may leave. Um, this is what I do for a living. Most people get these leases and they file them away in a drawer and they collect the rent. And they don't really take a deep dive into it. And then when they get a phone call like that, the general assumption is, well, even if we take a little bit less, it's still better than nothing. Where when we buy these, we know the industry because it's all we do all day, every day. Um, we probably would not, not probably, we definitely would not have taken a, a rent reduction request from a company like that. And it's funny because, not that it's funny, but certainly, if you take a look at the amendment they provided you guys, the, um, you know, the, one of the clauses in there essentially, <laughs> essentially says that you guys, you, the lessor, is entering into this of your own free will mm-hmm. and volition and has a, the ability to go to an attorney to have this looked at. So the, and these people have no... Um, ability to demand or either demand a rent reduction and or affect the lease at all because they're not party to the lease. And I'm not pointing that out to make it sound like you guys you know, didn't do your jobs. If these people are very good at what they do, they've been doing it and they, the, the largest, the single largest line item on the balance sheet for all the wireless phone companies as well as the tower companies are these ground leases. So anything they can do, so they'll rent out, they'll hire out a company like MP7 for a given geographic area, for a given length of time. Let's say, you know, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont for six months. A carrier that hires them will give them all the lease information as well as the contact information for every lease they have in those areas. And they set them loose. They say, we'll pay you a percentage of whatever you save us in this area over the next six months. And then these carriers just swap between MD7 and Black Dog and swap different areas of the country. And when they get done, they start over. So that's one of the, you know, that is one of the tactics they use because they can't really come to you themselves. Because then if you said, oh, either pay us what you owe us or take your stuff off our town hall and get out of here, they'd have to do that. If you say that to a third party, they're not obligated to do anything. They can just walk away and pretend like the call never happened. And the only other, I guess, industry piece of information I'd like to impart this evening is because these are cancelable in 30 days or 60 days or 90 days, we take a, a kind of a look and classify the all of the carriers and all the leases around the country basically in three ways. Urban, suburban, and rural. And in a case where you're looking at a rural site, and you also would consider, you know, basically a rural site. The biggest threat to the rural towers at this point is, right now, it's Elon Musk and Starlink Communications. Him adding satellites at an alarming rate. The carriers feel they don't have to upgrade the, well, they're not incentivized, certainly, to upgrade the rural sites with new equipment going forward because the expectation is they're going to have a hard time increasing subscription base in those areas to justify the, the cost investment in those sites. So essentially they're saying, hey, if, if we lose subscribers to Starlink, then that's just the cost of doing business. And if they lose the significant enough subscriber base to those in those rural areas, they almost let those carries, those you know, those placements go defunct. That was 375,000 sites around the country. And more often than not, the carriers don't, uh, 
seven years before he gets enough bandwidth in low off low earth orbit to really take a chunk out of our business. But it's coming. Like anything else, you know. Technology kinda advances every five years or so and we have to reevaluate. So at the moment we're you know, we're actively buying these leases to help on our portfolio basically to eliminate some of the risk we have inherent with losing any one risk. We do that by just adding as many as we can. For you, you know, losing one one lease would be essentially losing a, a four hundred thousand dollar asset. Whereas for us losing one lease, you know, isn't as large a portion of our portfolio. So we don't mind taking that risk because it offsets risk in general of anything that happens overall in the industry. So that's kind of how we do, how we go to market. Um, are there any questions, concerns, comments? From my, my very rough math, it looks like we're getting $2,800 now if we were to go with you per month. If we we thought if we broke it down, I know you you saying you're breaking it down to ten payments, but if like we think about it in our twelve payments per year as it is right now, right? Because it's a monthly lease. That's how we get our payments. Or yeah, so you guys get you guys get paid monthly as we as we sit here. Okay, so so it equates to twenty eight thirty three thirty three, or roughly there. That seems like a huge jump, and I'm just seems good too good to be true, I guess. For a six hundred dollar jump. Uh, can I just ask you? I'm not sure that we're on the same. Uh, I'm not sure what number you're quoting. I apologize. No, it's fine. If, like currently, you're getting six. Let's say sixteen thirty-seven is what you'll be getting as of July first. That's um, that's the kind of the number I'm using to base my my offer off. Right. And you're saying what's the, what's the increase? So well, what no, because. You you said that the buyout of the lease would be three forty. That's what you guys would proffer to us, or that's that's the range of three thirty to three forty. Yeah. So if you take that and divide that by the ten years or the ten payments, and then you divide that by twelve, that's what I got the twenty eight thirty three. Okay. So we, we can't. The one thing we can't do. And if that's the math, that's fine. I didn't do it that way. So we we cannot. Pay monthly, so we would just these would be, you know, ten payments over nine years paid out annually. So we cannot do monthly payments. Right. It would just it just more just, to, to it just more to keep it. I mean, essentially, if it's three hundred forty thousand dollars, right, and we divide that by ten, it's thirty four thousand dollars, you know, a year, right? Right. And that, so that's what you'd be getting a check for for thirty four thousand a year, and you're not paying any income tax because you're a municipality so you get the whole the whole portion of that proceeds right it just it just seems like that's a that's a big jump for us I mean it sounds good for us I don't it just uh, I'm not seeing the financial end on your end the compressing the time scale well, so I'll, I'll walk oh, you so that we should be sure. I mean, we're only paying you for essentially that comes out to even if you did that well if you did it over 10 years that's actually the lump sum payment so it's actually more because the if you took a look at the number I mentioned a second ago, it was 16, it was over 410,000. So let's say 410,000. 410,000 paid out over 108 months. We're, that's for a, that's for a, a 55 year easement, wireless easement on your tower. And the provisio is if they leave, whenever they leave, we don't keep our easement, our wireless easement intact. Once they leave, we, if we've been unable to add a second carrier and they leave, we give ourselves five years to try to backfill to recoup our losses. If after five years of the wireless easement space being empty or vacated, then we relinquish our right in the wireless easement. So essentially, you're, you're, we're paying for, you know, what is that? Two, five, we're, bench, we're essentially, over the course of 10 years, we're paying 21 years worth of rent to you over 10 years, but we have the right to collect rent for 55, should they be around that. Now, do we think they're going to be around in 55 years? Our, our crystal ball gets foggy after about 
eight or ten years. The idea is it gives us the ability to do that. We make our money if we can bring a second carrier to you because then our payback goes from 21 years immediately down to about 11 years. So for us, we're, in, we're heavily incentivized to try and find a second carrier for all the leases that we purchase because that reduced our payback time to a much more manageable level for us. Okay. To, to, your, to your, I guess, original point, yes, your, your math is correct, but it's even low because if you took $410,000 and you divided that by the, the 10, you know, nine payments over 108 months, you're, you're still closer to $40,000, you know, $40,000 a year, not even the, the $33,000 a year. Right. So this, we're not, this is not a, um, you know, people always think it's too good to be true. We've been doing this for a whole long time. We have successfully done this for a long time. Um, we understand the risk we're getting, you know, we're taking. This is not too good to be true. Uh, the, the intent for us is your property has been through permitting. Your property has an active wireless lease. So for us, we're stepping into a situation where it's already been granted, we're gonna be granted a floating wireless easement for say another 300 square feet. I say floating because we don't know what the, let's just pick it out, you know, for argument's sake, Verizon, Verizon, we're able to attract to the, to the site. They're going to say we need to go on the you know, the northeast corner and the southwest corner of the tower at a height of 59 feet, which is just above where the AT&T um, placement of their antennas is. Same provisions would apply. You would still have, you know, say as far as the static value, they would do a engineering feasibility study to make sure that it's structurally sound to hold the weight. Similar to the AT&T, they would take. I think AT&T took 230 or 240 square feet of uh, square feet of space in your basement. A company like Verizon or T-Mobile or Dish or Google would take the same amount of space. They'd run the cables the same way. And when they came on, we'd negotiate the lease and a new lease in your area would probably be closer to $2,000. In which case you'd be getting a new revenue stream of a thousand dollars and we would keep a thousand dollars we split it evenly with you and that's how we that's how we break it down and recoup our funds quicker than waiting around 20 years to do so and if you could multiply that by the number of times we've done this it, it's a you know it's a good business model it works it works and I'll, I'll say this it works but it's also very fair to the people we do it with. We're not doing, you know, this is not a, uh, we're not trying to sell you anything. There's nothing kind of underhanded about this. This is just the opposite. This is like you have a used car for sale in the town lot, and we're kicking the tires right now to see if it makes any sense to buy it. So we've looked under the hood by looking at the lease. We've, you know, started the engine by reading the First Amendment. So now we're saying, hey, something you'd like to do, I'd be happy to put together a formal proposal and send it over to you guys. You guys can review it. I think Sandy had mentioned you have another meeting May 2nd, I believe she had mentioned. May 4th. So I could provide her, May 4th, I'm sorry. So I could provide you via Sandy a uh, hard copy proposal that you guys can take a look at either between now and then, and then at that meeting, if you'd like, I'd be happy to come back on and answer any additional questions or concerns. I'd also be happy to share, if you're interested, copies of our closing documents. If you have an in-house counsel, you'd like to have them reviewed, I'd be happy to do that. So you can see it. there'd be two, um, two sets of documents. One would be our, our DEA, which is our easement agreement, and the other one is called a net profits agreement, which Okay, go, 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 hold on just yes, a minute sir. here. We have any interest in going any further with this? I don't, I don't think so. It just sounds to be... Joe, it's been nice. We appreciate your uh, presentation. Uh, 
the members here really don't feel that there's going to be a need to continue at a further date with this. But we do thank okay. you for your interest. That's fine. I have no problem with that. I appreciate your time tonight. I'd still be happy to send a, a copy over to Sandy. You guys can show it over. But um, after that, if you are not interested in pursuing it, that's entirely your decision. Very good. Great. Have a very pleasant evening, sir. You too. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. <laughs> Summer rec program update. <laughs> oh, Lisa, but Lisa's on. She's out of town. She's out of town. Yep. She's in Florida, I think. And Lori, Lori sent me an email this afternoon that she's in, she she couldn't, couldn't make it. it. So we just should we just push it to yeah. Well, like just, um, Put it, put it on for the fourth. You want the best? Uh, Maria's here. We don't want her to have the least Right. Uh, is there anybody here for the Master Gardener? Yes. Yeah. All we have on that is just an application, I believe. Um, I assume everybody here has had a chance to read it in your packet. Yeah. Uh, pretty much, you guys are handling the actual application. We've got a copy of it here. Um, is everybody all right with them going ahead with applying for their grant? Yes. yes. Yeah. Very good. We go right ahead with the grant. I might add this nice down there. I go by there every day, so. Exactly. It's very visible. Yeah. Everybody notices it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Where the hell was I here? Number uh, 10. Okay, I called that and missed it. Okay, okay, Maria. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry about that. I was I was aiming for to be early for 7.30. I didn't realize things would go so smoothly. Congratulations. Um, so, um, we are moving ahead. We've got, let's see, um, We've got fireworks penciled in. We're going to get you that form that we had last year um, for all that information about the fireworks that you need to have. We don't have that yet, but we will have that for you in a timely manner. Um, we're still working on where and when the food trucks are going to be here and various recreation. I went to the recreation committee meeting last week, and they are tentatively supportive of having the Wallingford Day be, um, be a, I guess a subcommittee of the Recreation Committee, I mean be, be under the auspices of the Recreation Committee. Um, Sumio, who was here before, has volunteered to be the liaison between Recreation Committee and Wallingford Day. Um, the one question that came up was what was the liability of the town for the day of of the event, and we're still figuring that out. If that's something above and beyond usual. If it's if this is a long, if this is a town event, if, if long the day is a town committee, there's not going to be anything extra. Uh, okay. Assuming the fireworks people have their own insurance, they do, and they have to provide proof of that. So, right. so I mean, if, if the long for day group decides to become with along with RAC a subcommittee or whatever and you do all the open meeting laws agendas and minutes right. and like that then it's just it's a town committee just like conservation and energy and if they put something on like conservation does the winter days over there there's no extra you're just volunteers of the town right there's no extra okay that makes that makes a ton of sense and and that just means we have to be a little more organized about announcing our meetings well i mean you you're but I understand. Two minutes anyway, so right. Well, we an agenda. Right. We just need a yeah, a more a more clear agenda and um, to put it out in time to warn it in time. But I think I'm. I think we can handle that. So, but but we're we're moving on. There's. Um,
plans for a, there's still talk, there's about a historical tour of Wallingford. There's going to be a scavenger hunt where people go around and look for things around town. Um, things that already exist, not things that we place there. Um, there's going to be encouragement for people to do pallets with a sunflower theme, but that's not going to be um, a huge part of it this year. Um, what else? We're, we're in the last stages of hiring a DJ for the evening, which just to change it up a little bit from live music, and also that offers us a broader range of music that can maybe bring in everybody and can go right up until the fireworks. So we're trying to find someone who might be flexible for a rain date, knowing weather. And um, is, if, if, would you have all, any questions about how long for day is likely to go right now? Sounds great. Oh. <laughs> great. This is, this is just to give you an update and let you know what progress we made since questions people had last week, last meeting. And Are you going to be promoting it on social media outside of like us? Like in terms of like making a page on Facebook? We have a page on Facebook already that exists. Um, Jane Duda actually is going to take part in that and that's, that's an area of her um, professional Realm. So she's she's going to take that on. I just need to remember to share it with her. So yes, we're going to do it that way. Um, we're going to talk to local media as, as much as we can. Um, we we're, we're out of practice. We did this the first year, and then it was COVID, yeah. and so we need to get back on top of that. But yes, um, oh, there was something else. Oh, and we're also talking about promoting local, especially local food businesses here, like Victorian Inn and Kelly's, and the cafe and the other cat, both the Main Street Cafe and Sweet Birch, so that um, along with the food trucks that are coming in, because the morning will bring in a lot of people for the yard sales, and that'll be a great time for everybody. Um, and Mama Tamara's. Yeah. So all the local local businesses, we're hoping to help promote them along with <coughs> whatever we're bringing in. Well, I would, I would just suggest at some point, if you decide that that's the way you want to go, is to be a town committee and then either at this meeting or a future meeting, just make that request so okay. that we can put it in the minutes and the, you know, the board can vote on that you're officially a town committee if that's the direction you decide to go. In. Or a ta a, can we, would we say committee or subcommittee or is that the same thing, really? I mean, I think, I think we can do subcommittee. A subcommittee of the rec committee because I think we are most directly related to recreation. I, I, I feel comfortable making that request right now if that would be acceptable to the board. Does it have to go through Brian because he would, he's the chair of the rec? Or is it can Maria do it? Yeah, I mean, I, you, yeah, it might be worth me going to him and having, asking if he would make that request. I think that would be appropriate. Right. Just to make sure that it's the whole book board as much as possible. Yeah, exactly. Make sure it's what the rec committee wants too. Exactly. Yeah, which, which I, I will think go back to their next meeting and I'll talk to them, or yeah. I'll at least talk to Sumio and have him bring it to the meeting if I can't make it. That's a great idea. Thank you. Good. That's terrifying. Wow. Just a bit. Here comes the snow. <laughs> Better hustle home. <laughs> oh, it's coming. Five to eight overnight. I'm sorry for switching my What's next? Summer salaries. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sandy tells me that uh, the young Luna lady that's been our lifeguard for the last two years uh, was not going to be able to do it, but she now is going to be available uh, three days a week as a lifeguard. Uh, I would just know before we get into the salaries, this is going to be your third year. So I think probably 
we're going to have to consider that she be paid a little more than we would normally pay the uh, well we have one initial lifeguard who this will be his first year I think you have to take in consideration that uh, three years to the one year and give her a slightly higher pay rate right especially when the new new kiddo he's not been certified yet so we're still waiting on him to be certified right. but she's certified and goes she's through next year and all of that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. as that i said she's done the last two years yeah so. um you have a list basically of the the ones that have to be set here um i would note that basically we gave the town employees a three percent raise uh, or we budgeted for a three percent raise um, for the uh, transfer station and uh, the highway guys we only uh, budgeted for a one percent raise uh, that being because we had actually uh, with the new hire we had raised all three members due to the changes to the uh, the starting rate for Lori um, does anybody have any suggestion what they'd like to look at my my own thought was that uh, for the uh, employees possibly three percent again for them uh, and that we would take into consideration the lifeguard is separate I noticed that uh, the concession employees were only paid the 11.75 last year uh, and minimum this year at 12.55 so that would be more than a three percent raise I believe I'd come out with something like a 6.8 percent uh, but I think that as that gentleman pointed out is the cost of doing business staying legal and then uh, Alia or Alia she would have to also go up because she's at 1224 right yeah so she's definitely has to go up at least to minimum wage and then what we think is appropriate um she was paid 1224 three percent with her would only be 1261. my thought is that is why don't we round it to 13 with her if that's agreeable with everybody yeah. 13 for leah 13. I think three percent for everybody else, especially with how inflation is hitting everybody. I think that's yeah more than okay, or not more than okay, but it's what we can do. We should but traditionally, in the time I've been here, it's normally been from one to four percent. Okay. This table is so squeaky every time I move. So, is there anything want, else that we need to look at? Sandra? Yeah, we need. What do, what do you want to pay Ethan? Who? Ethan. Oh right, he's the new one. You gotta yeah. pay him minimum um, wage, right? Oh, uh, I mean, we usually pay lifeguards more than concession. I mean, concession always gets minimum. We pay lifeguards more than that. right. Lifeguards should make a decent amount more, considering the responsibility that they have over a concession person. Right. And it's, so, so the well, last year she was paid about fifty cents above the concession rate. So do we change it to like 1325 and then we can put Ethan at um, 1275 or something like that? That seems reasonable. So that, he, that the lifeguard is still, even if it's not that much of a big bump, especially if it's his first time doing it then? Yeah. Yeah. He definitely will, needs more than the uh, concession does, so. Yeah. Yeah, because he'll be on for more than something. Right. What's that do to the budget? That, does that work? Is that good for everybody? So 1275 for Ethan and 1325 for Aaliyah? Yeah. Yeah. I think 3% for the Ross. I think it would be good to look at culpable positions at other places for future, not for this year. Because that could be part of our issue in trying to find lifeguards. Yeah. Is That's an issue everywhere. Proctor no, no, I know. But I also know the other places pay more. <laughs> so they're going to, anybody that is going to be there would be going to the higher pay rate. It just may so, be something to look yeah. into for the future. Right, for the next F uh, Yeah, FY. not this year, but right. maybe the future to when we look at it again next time. Mm 
The passive safety grant, this is for the guys down to the garage. Uh, basically, they're looking at signage package. Uh, and you do have a copy of the uh, application here. I assume that we're all okay with that. Sandy's put us in for this, I think, the last three, maybe four years. Yeah, but especially if it's 100% this year and 50-50 next year, I feel like we need to. Yeah. And um, the road crew picked out these items, too. So they had the chance to weigh in what they wanted. They wanted the sign packages. Oh, uh, let's see. Inches. Minutes to resignation. I do have, uh, I'm going to take it under this one here too, the, uh, we received, I think you've got a notice of it, that uh, Bill Brooks has submitted his resignation right. uh, for the De Development Review Board and the Planning Commission. Uh, Bill was actually the former uh, chairman of the board for a number of years. If at all possible, Sandy, I would actually add on to your little letter here, uh, thanking him for his years on the select board and for his leadership. I want to say I think he was a chair for six years. By consent, is you're accepting his resignation. Pardon? We're accepting his resignation. <laughs> We're <gonna> say no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry, yes. you have to stay. <laughs> I'm assuming by consent. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't uh, think I want to force him into it. <laughs> Lynn Brown approached Sandy, I'd say a week or two ago, and uh, suggested at the time three benches along Main Street. I have to agree that benches on Main Street would be handy. Uh, I think somewhere it's in your stuff that we had a photograph of the bench that was being made for the, the stone carving studio. Uh, that's what's referred to here in your paperwork, uh, that that might be one. Um, it might well be what they'd like to put over at the library. Yeah, uh, I think it would look nice over there. Uh, so I I would be totally in favor of assuming that it is offered to us that we accept and ask the library if we can install it there. And it's also a major regional um, artist yeah. studio. So being able to have another piece of art in town is always it always cool. helps. Yeah. Uh, currently, I'm sure you're familiar with Rutland is making a, uh, I'd have to say, a, a well-organized uh, effort for art in the downtown area. Yeah. Uh, I'm on the operations team of 77 Art, which is an artist residency right. in town. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we're, there's lots of art being happening, art happening. I mean, there was conversation about putting that stone bench at the boy with the boo. I just don't know. We'd have to. It it It'd be tight. And that was the whole discussion we had about the yeah. bus bench. Or something like that. <coughs> if, if we had something like for a bus bench and use that for that bench, yeah. and then had something nice in front of the library, especially because it gets a nice sun, and it would just look nice. It would be. Uh, it would be able to be away and not have to be crowded with everything else. Mm -hmm. So I guess the big question is where would the other ones go if we did do this and do we have the budget or how would we fund this? <laughs> it wasn't budgeted, so. Right. I think, I think that is, but just throwing it out there for the moment, uh, from my own observation, there is a tremendous amount of foot traffic, particularly during the summer, going to St. Patrick's Cemetery. Yeah. I think that area of the shoulder there that with the trees and everything. I think that would be a potential spot that we might pull one in there. I know a lot of people walk down and then stop and wait around there and then come back. Right. 
Oh, it would be a great rest stop. The only thing I would think is that come winter, then that's void. Basically, it wouldn't be accessible. It's hard telling. Yeah. Yeah. Hard, for sure, hard telling. But just because that sidewalk ends right there. And then, yeah. Yeah. But I, I like that idea, especially because it'd be able to look at the fountain and everything yeah. would be cool. <coughs> it's a cool idea. I think if somebody wants to find funding for it, that'd be nice. <laughs> it'd be really nice to get if we did the stone bench, like say the library. If we got two other sort of art projects for the other two. I mean, maybe completely different. Maybe somebody could do a wood project on another bench. I don't know. Just no, it'd be good to have three bench art projects. And we, the Chaffee did that recently in Rutland with their. Um, they made they did art benches where they would have artists design benches, and then they were sponsored by different um, organizations in Rutland in the area. Um, and those are really pretty. That something like that could be fun with. You get like the stone house or is the stone shop, or you get. Mama Tomorrow's or Sweet Birch or somebody else to kind of put a few shekels in there for that. That may be something, a really fun way to do it. And then you the town and it would have a plaque saying, this has been sponsored by yada, yada, yada. And even for those, they, they bought the benches um, independently. And then, then the artists would come and paint them or decorate them. It's a really cool project. City's had a number of nice projects. They had the uh, hearts that were painted, and then distributed. And yeah, and number of things. Yeah, and trains, and then all, of course, all the mural work that they've been doing. Yeah, um, it might it'd be a fun, a fun thing. It might be worth it to. It might be worth it to, for somebody to look into. It might be. I don't know if that would be prudential or it would be maybe wreck just because of the art angle. I was thinking wreck too. Mm -hmm. And Sumio. Yeah, assuming you know, be, I, being I an think, expert, uh, expert potter. And, I would think either the wreck or the conservation would be interested. Yeah. The Elson Lake Dock, <laughs> uh, there's not much to say it's going to be delivered. Hopefully, the road crew gets it in. Good question. Uh, what do we do with the old one? Yeah. Does anybody want it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> put it together, have a huge. Uh, It's still usable, right? Well, yeah, that's it. Um, I mean, other than the ladder's broke. The ladder's broke, but it's still usable. I don't know if there'd be somebody out there that would uh, try to sell it. And if it <laughs> doesn't sell, sell it, we give it away. Facebook garage. <laughs> yeah, you know, if we were to give Castleton a call, they've got a beach over there. I wouldn't be surprised that maybe somebody in the Castleton office might know somebody in their recreation over there that could. Put it, put it right out there in their, in their swimming areas there. Or even one of the homeowners. Or the, or the boys camp. Well, I was wondering if somebody else right Boys camp, yeah. yeah. I don't know how much they use their beach. Just put it in the water and just push, <laughs> just push it out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I was a kid, <laughs> when I was a kid, there was a dock at the boys camp and there was actually a walk out on pier uh, that you could anchor a boat at or go out and fish on it that'd be cool uh, i'd like to see that at our beach yeah slug board concerns or comments i think we've covered about everything <laughs> we could think of we have the uh, application uh, for this. one thing we should bring up right, we do have the Information that was gathered, Kathy, uh, no, Kathy Bill didn't was, make it. It was Kathy, Sandy, and did, you went with them too, didn't you, Bruce? No. On the sidewalks? Yeah. No, Peg Soul and Bruce Dobbins. Bruce Dobbins. Bruce Dobbins. Uh, I was absolutely shocked when I saw the, the paperwork that they gave us that, uh, The, the uh, V-Trans, you know, you're looking at three, four hundred thousand dollars Yeah. Uh, hopefully, if we did get a grant, it would be down to probably less than a hundred. Uh, I don't know if Bruce is going to share this with the ARPA committee. I do hope he does, and hopefully we can apply for it and be successful 
with this grant. Uh, I think it's a general consensus with all of us that School Street can use the sidewalk or Every day I go down that, that street with, with Lucy bouncing around and um, coffee flying everywhere, so that'd be nice. Personally, I, I would love to see some areas of the, the uh, main sidewalk on Main Street, but I think right now with the kind of money that they're looking at, uh, I think if we can get the grant for the school street, well, we should be thankful for that. And is this, this is my understanding of this before was that it was always the Prudential Committee that took care of the sidewalks in town? This is a war that's been going on for <laughs> years. Because uh, it seems like it's been a very long time that this has been in disarray. So it just, it, I worry about like, what do you say there's a couple on, on South Main, there's definitely a couple spots or Wallingford House, like that, that hedge and everything else like that. There's definitely spots that we could t attack there, there sooner are, rather than later versus there are a couple of spots where the, you've got to rise where the sidewalk is a tripping yeah problem the side the sidewalk okay right but it needs to be attended to either dug out and lowered or like the whatever. munson house with the brick right there we lucy always hits that and mm -hmm. i nearly go over over the handlebars every single time so <laughs> if i don't remember <laughs> so yeah it, I, but I, it just it's one of those things of can we, is there a way to spend less money in increments, not for school, because so we don't get into a situation with School Street again? But the, the boards I've been on, because of the um, unanswered question of who really owns and maintains them, yeah. um, I've been hesitant to put a lot of money into it. The last board, agreed that we would put 2,000 in and the Prudential would meet us and also put 2,000 in. Okay. Obviously by some of these numbers, four grand isn't gonna go for <laughs> No, it's not. Um, One brick. <laughs> but Bill and I, our, th our theory on it was if we can come up with four and get a grant, that was 20, and maybe we could do some minor work. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I would not be opposed to seeing them actually look at a little more than the 85 here with the expectation that they may do some repairs yeah. in other areas. Um, that would be my thought of maybe even referencing that to Bruce for them to keep in mind when they do make their final allocations. Yeah. So you're saying to increase or... I would think that if we're looking at 85,000 Maybe along the way we can suggest to them another 10 or 15. Um, that could be used other than just the school Other than the 85, you yeah. know, maybe look at 100 or whatever. Um, even if that wasn't included in the grant, that would give us a few, a few dollars to work with repairing. Right. Uh, we've got a lot of asphalt stuff that uh, I don't know how much we could do, but perhaps some of the areas in our asphalt, maybe we could get with the, uh, excuse me, the paving contract, we could get them to consider some of that stuff too. Right. But I know, is, has um, Wallingford Crush Stone ever sponsored sidewalks? Because like, I know Omia and Proctor, they, they sponsor, they, I know they sponsor like a basketball court and stuff like that at the school, if that's ever been a thing. I don't believe it's ever been proposed. Okay. At least not in my Just as like a, a, a whole advertisement for the business. I don't know. <laughs> this is spitballing to an extreme after we've Great been... idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Ka um, Kathy, when she comes back the next meeting, she's going to do a full report. But um, Devin from Rutland Regional said for these grants, they won't approve asphalt. It has to be concrete sidewalks. Okay. But it's not to say if we, you know used our own money separately, we could fix patches cheaper with asphalt, but for the grant has to become. Because the asphalt parts are South Main on the west side, and then on Hall, or their Hall, right? Am I remembering correctly? I'm just trying to get the bumpiest part. Yeah, some Hall is asphalt. And then all of School Street, like to my house. No. And past it. 
we did also get a uh, letter from the town of Rutland addressing what uh, I, I can't tell you how many years I've been telling the town some of the prior boards before I was even on them that this is going to happen eventually they is going to be a change in dispatching services statewide when um, and again I'm not sure Rowan Town is seemingly taking the lead on trying to get something uh, you know a board created uh, for the towns in the area to do a dispatching uh, I talked with Steve a couple years back when he was still the sheriff and this was at the time that they were doing the two dispatch centers one down in Westminster and one in Colchester um, and he was looking at the time that is the state approved going to local dispatches uh, the sheriff's department was going to bid on it and honestly the numbers were frightening he was looking at upwards of four hundred thousand dollars for his startup to cover 24-hour dispatching services you've got uh, dispatchers manning the central station wherever it is uh, then you have to uh, come up with the actual dispatching boards uh, you have to tie it into the 911 system uh, but anyhow at that time he was looking at upwards of 400,000 to start up um, you've got Rutland Town already looking at doing this as an entity yeah. uh, being funded by all these towns my real problem with the whole problem right now is nobody is pushing back against the state police on going through with this plan to discontinue the services 30 years ago when i first started as a constable major lavalley who was the uh, assistant uh, commander of the state police was already pushing to get the state police out of it i see no advantage to building six new dispatching centers manning six new ones when the state police currently have everything in place in the two centers five years ago when that two center operation was proposed that was going to be the cure-all now they don't the state police don't want to be the central agency quite honestly the state police want to become a highway patrol they don't want to patrol small towns they don't want to do traffic in small towns they don't want to be responsible for answering these nickel and dime calls where somebody's silver dollar coin collection got stolen their initial mandate their uh, purpose for being was to be an agency that would handle major crime provide technical support to law enforcement agencies over time they have pretty much dominated law enforcement in the state of vermont why they have this push that they don't want to be any longer be the dominant law enforcement in vermont I really don't understand we've got a state police dispatch center that works by their own account they have 193 different entities that they're dispatching for and I might add quite well why are we going to go to a half a dozen newly created dispatch centers all at an enormous cost to the towns you have small towns like Mount Holly who I'm pretty sure have nothing in their budget now for dispatching services beyond what Mount Holly Rescue may be contributing. 
Uh, Wallingford certainly uh, is going to be shocked by the amount of money. Wallingford is the eighth largest town in this county. After you get past Wallingford, you've got Danby, Mount Tabor, uh, Mount Holly, towns that are not budgeting for any of these services through the town. The state police are being paid out of the general fund. Everybody in every one of these towns is paying taxes to the state. Let the state continue paying for it out of the general fund. These services are for every single person in the state of Vermont. Why are you trying to make each individual town responsible for their own residents? It's also the standards of callers, uh, of, of the answerers and everything else. Like That's going to go down when you have so many different organizations trying to patchwork it together versus somebody who's been doing it for a long time. Yeah. Where are you going to find them? Yes, and where are you going to find that many dispatchers? <laughs> yeah. you imagine the transition? Well, hopefully our two state senators and hopefully our resident, or representatives will start thinking about doing some pushback. Um, is there a coalition of towns that is like starting to sign letters by on behalf of select board saying not that I know of no um, in their letter here to us they mentioned that uh, I think they're basically trying to form a loose coalition and they're looking for our support personally I can't support this whole idea uh, push comes to shove and they force us into this we will have to go along with whatever the county does i mean we can't be without dispatch services um, i just don't like with what they're doing to us is there a way that we can say we support the fact that you guys are trying to plan for this but we just do not support the circumstances of why you have to plan for it or I've, do we have or do we just wait and see if there's other towns that start to talk about it more well i think even before we start waiting to see what the other towns do, I'm not as sure how many of these towns have local local people who have been involved in law enforcement, rescue, uh, all the services that are being dispatched. Right. Um, you know, I, like uh, Mount Holly doesn't have a police department. They have a minimal... Uh, rescue squad we share a lot with Mount Holly uh, but a number of these towns I don't think have anybody aware of what's really being pushed here yeah I am because my son is deeply involved in this and I spent 30 years being dispatched uh, I, I would myself like to see us trickle a word up to Rutland Town that maybe we may be forced to do this, but let's push back on with our legislators and at least raise the question of the actual need of going to this type of a system when we have something that is working. It's not perfect. I don't know of any dispatch system anywhere that's perfect, but certainly what we have for what the individual taxpayer is paying is probably our best deal. Right. Do we know if the, our representatives are even aware of this themselves to know to push back on it? That's it. Would, would it be all right to have Sandy just drop a note to them that? Hi. We that's, would, that's a pro. We'd like your support of asking our representatives to push back against us. I would think so. it, just as much 11, as other towns may not have the knowledge on it, who's yeah, our representatives yeah. the, do The either. state is looking at $11 million currently to do the changeover, and only 3000 of that, or $3 million is for down the road. For $11 million is not going to cost, or is not going to cover what the total cost is to all these for this number of dispatch centers that they have. 
I mean, basically, aside from possibly Rowan PD, uh, Burlington certainly is in a different boat. I'm sure Chittenden County is all in over this. Uh, but I sincerely doubt that St. Johnsbury, Newport, smaller areas like that are going to be in favor of this. Or like a Peru or a been, land grove where you're in the middle of the woods. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Has there been some kind of movement on this, Nelson? Because, I mean, we've been hearing this for 10 years now that, that it's been going away, but it never does go away. Yeah, it just gets kicked down the road a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I remember my kids in the fire department 12 years ago talking that the state was threatening they were gonna, they were gonna stop dispatch services, but and it has never happened. I guess it's the thing like, it, do we, is, is it, do we, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It, seem, it seems writing like- Writing a letter it, does seem like a good idea to do. Yeah, I, like reps. writing a letter saying, and saying it definitely to Rutland Town, and then maybe if we have relations with other smaller towns and saying, you know, this is something we noticed, we respect what you want to choose for, but we just want to let you know this is what we've thought about. What we think is best for our town would probably would be something similar for yours. Well, you got general sense of you got general sense of what we're saying. Yes. Cool. My thought is we leave it to Sandy to come up with her normal. Yeah. The polished version of our very <laughs> <laughs> uh, Is there anything else? We got an application, right? For oh, yes. What was it? Yeah, Josh. For a an application for waiting. Oh on. yeah. Oh Lord, yes. Um, he's looking at concessions. I noticed on that that it said that uh, highest grade completed was twelve. Has he graduated high school already? He's currently graduating. Yeah. 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 Oh. He's a he's a really good kid. He actually could have sold himself better in this, honestly, because <laughs> he's the head of several committees at school. He's an interact club. He's try M. I assume everybody's in favor. He's a great guy. So yeah, and I checked him with Peter Bruno on his list because he's just a personal friend, and he said that he's an excellent stand-up. He know. really is. Great. Yeah. Jill, uh, our assistant town clerk knows him too. She said he would be excellent. He's, yeah. <coughs> I mean, he's a hard worker. and He's got a great personality. Yeah. Excellent. Apparently, a very nice singing voice. Amazing singing voice. <laughs> it's not even nice. It's amazing. <laughs> Is there anything else I've overlooked? <laughs> if not, so. how about a motion to second? Motion to adjourn. Seconded. All in favor. Aye. 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 Aye.